In just three months, we'll have another batch of graduates leave this university and go out into the working world. And as they look back on the first five years of their career in the half decade ahead, and as all of us look back on the evolution of our careers in the coming years, I think we'll have a lot to say about how technology and artificial intelligence affected our work. Uh, maybe we'll say that it helped to augment our skills. We got the more done with the same amount of input. Maybe we'll be able to say that AI helped to automate some of the more boring or monotonous aspects of our work, and we got to focus on more creative tasks. In my line of work, I have people ask, will AI take our jobs? And so it's an interesting question. What are the jobs that are safe in the next decade, uh, and which are the ones that are maybe ripe for automation? Uh, my business, Tech Emergence, focuses on the impact of artificial intelligence in different business sectors. And so this is what we study. I'm lucky enough to talk to AI leaders at Silicon Valley giant companies like the uh, headquarters of Facebook and Airbnb and a lot of these companies you folks might know, but also to speak with the researchers in this domain, the people working on the hard science of artificial intelligence. And our last poll asking about AI risk to these researchers, uh, in this case a little bit over 30 PhDs in the AI domain, uh, we asked them in the next 20 years, what are the greatest risks to society that AI might posit? And the biggest cluster was around automation in the economy, sort of job market concerns, roughly speaking. Not quite as bad as it could be. As you can see, you know, you got about four folks in the killer robot category. Uh, so uh, personally, I, I'd much rather not have a job than, uh, you know, be killed by a robot. Um, so <laughs> um, uh, automation and the job market was sort of the biggest cluster of the folks who did respond, who felt confident enough to posit a guess, mostly professors, MIT, University of Montreal, et cetera. That was the category where they put a lot of the risk. And so my work was in 12 minutes to sort of distill hundreds of surveys like this and hundreds and hundreds more interviews into some core concepts around what demonstrates job security and what, what leaves something ripe for automation. Um, and I've tried to boil it down into three concepts, and so we'll dive into the first one. The first one I think about as context. So um, I'll frame this in some examples. So there's limited context roles, and there's broad or varied context roles we might think about. In the, uh, the domain of welding, for example, if you weld on uh, an automation line in some sense, you get a certain kind of input, you do a certain kind of work, and you send it off in the other end, um, you have, again, a certain number of things that come to you, a certain number of things that you do, and a thing that you produce. This is the kind of work that machines tend to be rather good at. Even before artificial intelligence, this is the low-hanging fruit for automation. That's not really going to change. That's certainly going to uptick in the years ahead. But people think that often it's blue-collar work that's the most automatable. Definitely not the case. There's plenty of extremely varied context, quote-unquote, blue-collar work. Uh, one example might be in uh, plumbing for example. So my best friend growing up in this small town is actually a plumber here. His name's Josh. I had coffee with him this morning. Um, and that's a role that doesn't have a certain number of inputs, a certain kind of work, a certain kind of outputs. When you show up at a house, you don't know what to do. You ask, when was this boiler installed? What are your pipes made out of? And has this issue happened in the summer or is this only after the cold spike? Only after those kind of questions can you start to figure out what to even diagnose before you know what to do. Lots of context there, lots of physical dexterity, tough work for machines. When we finally do have machines that can roll up to your house, knock on your door, ask you how the day is doing, and, and go in your basement and fix your pipes, we'll have much bigger concerns than job security. We'll, we'll have uh, species dominance issues going on at that point, <laughs> uh, which, which I, think, I think we have a couple years before we really have to grapple with. Thank goodness. So uh, moving on, uh, we'll, we'll get into the white collar space. Um, actually, a lot of where I am in the Bay Area, a lot of the work being done on AI and industries being done in the, the white collar automation world. And so a lot of people think that inherently jobs that are better paid, that work with data for some reason are safer, not necessarily the case. Um, so if you're an auditor, for example, uh, you look at financial reports, you sort of look for certain kinds of discrepancies, and, and then you pass it along in the auditing workflow in some way, shape, or form, even at a high pay grade, and, and not in any way demeaning that kind of labor. To some degree, there are machines that will figure out how to read those numbers and find those discrepancies. And there's a lot of work actually in the bookkeeping, accounting, auditing space in terms of current automation efforts. A lot of work that just involves handling and processing data even high paid stuff, 70, 80K salaries, uh, there's companies going after that. Um, but there's varied context work in the white collar world that's much harder to automate. 
So if you work in the same finance department, you look at the same finance reports, but you also make decisions for purchasing. So for example, you don't just look at you know, where are we spending our money and what does that mean and look for those discrepancies, but you think about what does that mean for how many materials we need to purchase? What does that mean for what suppliers we should work with and how can those purchasing decisions and those varied suppliers and products affect our, the goals for profit margins for this quarter, for example? That's a lot of moving parts. That's negotiating. This is, this is safely in the purview of humans, much, much broader context that we're working in even if they get paid about the same. I, I will say to end on the context point, it's probably the most salient single point that I got from all of my interviews that if it's possible for you to be in a nook where you get a certain kind of inflow, you do a certain kind of work and you have a certain kind of output and have the changes in the industry and the changes in the nature of your customer pass you by without you knowing because you're face down, it's very, very easy to be left behind in the job field. Uh, this is an extremely salient point. And there's a comfort to that because the world is complex. Negotiations complex. Other humans are complex. And there's a, there's a comfort, but there's also a real helplessness with having someone else in the organization handle the complexities of the market and you just have a job. Um, but the, the, the big takeaway for me in re-listening to maybe 60 of these interviews was that if you want to see your interests represented in your industry, your own interests, your own career represented in your industry, you have to have your hands around the ugly, messy, real context of what's changing if you want to stay relevant. But luckily, there are some things outside of just context that are, are pretty safely in the human world. Um, working with people is a big part of this, but it's not all working with people. Uh, there are some people work that, that uh, is kind of low-hanging fruit for automation. If you work in a call center, uh, if you're a checkout clerk, there's companies gunning for you right now in a real, real big way in the next half a decade. Uh, not exactly safe places to be. But in terms of uh, human work, I break it down to two categories here. Coordination is a big one. If you manage other people, manage a sales team, for example, you've got to work with other people. You've got to marshal company resources, marshal technologies to reach company goals. This is a challenging, complex task, and it's more than machines can really manage in many regards. Similarly speaking, connection might not involve management in the same way, but if you're a school teacher, if you are a high-level B2B salesperson, if you are a nurse and connecting with other people, eye to eye, handshake, etc., is a critical part of your role and you're good at that, that's tough for machines to take away. Again, when your kindergartner you know, goes to school to bring an apple to the indistinguishably human-like robot teacher who shows affection to it and vice versa, we have much bigger issues than job security. Uh, <laughs> Species dominant stuff coming up. So um, th these, are, these are big and important points that I think uh, should come to the fore when it comes to working with people. These are kind of the major categories that come up time and time again. Uh, and the way I think about it is that when my grandmother was working, uh, over the course of her whole career, at some point there was a critical moment where she had to learn how to use a typewriter. And fortunately, she had the brain power to do that, and she, she did that. And that was, that was a juncture of kind of getting to the next level in her own career. In many of our spaces, you have to learn a new technology tool every three months or so. The rolling process of creative destruction is moving faster and faster, and staying ahead of that is a big reason why keeping a grasp on context is critical. Um, but the evolution of technology in our era will be more than just upgrades in our tools of what we use for work. Uh, it'll involve different ways to relate and indeed live as human beings. So as artificial intelligence progresses, we will have programs that preempt our needs and take actions on our behalf. Virtual reality combined with AI will be a place where we'll be able to go. Instead of having all these kinds of monitors, we'll have everything we need displayed in front of us, entertainment and work in interfaces that we can't even currently imagine right now. And brain-machine interface in the next 20 or 30 years, I think is going to become a much bigger deal. Already today, for more than a decade, Folks with severe depression can get electrodes drilled through their skull and into their pleasure centers in order to keep stave off thoughts of suicide and, and alleviate really extreme uh, depression. And folks born without the ability to hear can have brain stem implants to grant them a sense that they were never born with. You can see videos of this. It's pretty beautiful stuff. But in the decades ahead, as we evolve more in altering our emotion, altering our senses, uh, these will be bigger questions than what are we doing with these tools, but more of what are we turning ourselves into? when VR becomes a more important place than the real world, when artificial intelligence manages businesses or states, and when we can alter happiness and intelligence itself, will we do that? Uh, I think for better or for worse, we probably will, and we should probably grapple with it. Uh, and these are, as, as we're frantically kind of moving around an increasingly virtual world, 
I think there will be an increasing uh, shift towards control in the physical world, particularly in what's most important and increasingly more important in the physical world, which is the computing that houses the virtual experiences. The computing that houses the intelligence of our increasingly super intelligent machines a decade, two decades out. The machines that house the experiences piped in and out of brains 20 years from now in brain machine interface. Um, that so the, the notion of playing God, when this becomes more than kind of a play on words, I think there's, there's organizations and nations that are going to be very, very interested in taking that seriously. Uh, and um, more or less as we sort of move forward into the future, I think that's going to be a concern that maybe we're not quite prepared with. But uh, fortunately, these, these aren't things that most of us are going to have to grapple with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, for us, if in the future the entertainment's good and we got a job, that's kind of what matters. Um, you know, job security, uh, if we're getting our paycheck, we don't really have to grapple with the ultimate complexities of sort of the future of the human condition. But you'd think if we have the will to do whatever it takes to make sure we keep a job for ourselves, maybe we could direct a bit of that effort towards directing the great creative destructive wave that will not just overhaul careers, will overhaul what, overhaul what it is to be human. Uh, and maybe the nook that we hide in and could be left behind in is our job security nook. And maybe there's a context, an ugly complex context of the human condition that we should wrap our hands around if we want to ensure our interests are represented in the future of our species. That's all I got. Thanks. <laughs>